Hi there. Welcome to NAB Talk, brought to you by the NAB Wealth Financial Group, helping you reach your destination in life on purpose. I'm your host, Simon Prowse, and each episode will bring you educational, inspirational and informative interviews on a broad range of topics. Hello, and welcome to NAB Talk. Today, we have the great pleasure of talking with Vanessa Benner. Vanessa is a performance coach with Next Evolution Performance. And in a nutshell, I believe Vanessa's content is all around the art of getting the best out of your people. Without further ado, I'll introduce Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Simon. Thanks for having me today. Great to be here. Oh, thank you. And thank you for taking the time out to speak with me and My being pleasure. on that talk. Um, Vanessa, to set the scene a little bit, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey um, as to as to how you got here in mm. the first place. Yeah, so I used to work in financial services. I did that for many years, and which I loved at the time. And uh, and then that included being the head of sales for a global funds management company, uh, also during the global financial crisis. So. Working in sales is always a bit of a high pressure environment, um, but I was always really focused on making sure that we could get the best out of people and get great results, but also without burning people out. Because one of the things that I saw was happening a lot, especially in the global financial crisis, was that uh, people were having to work harder, they were having to do more with less. They were getting asked a lot more questions from clients, which was increasing the workload. And people were really stressed and people were getting quite sick as well and burnt out. And this was, you know, cast your mind back, that was well before burnout was really a thing and articulated um, so well as what it is now. But there was definitely something there. And I've always worked in the fitness industry part-time as well. So I teach fitness classes part-time. I still teach a couple a week to this day. And I really saw that there was a need for helping people to focus on the performance side of things, but without getting burnt out in the process. So I didn't, I was pretty sure I was onto something. I was probably about 95% sure I was onto something and 5% totally wetting myself. Um, But I thought there was something in this and I thought, you know what, I'll give it two years And if I don't like it, or if it's not a thing that people are interested in, well, you know, someone will pay me to sell something at some point in time after that. So I thought, oh, look, you know, let's give it a go. I was lucky enough through other contacts um, who uh, introduced me to my now business partner. So I had met her and she was already doing something like this over in the UK. And I thought, I'm pretty sure this has got legs. So I just took a leap of faith and uh, and started doing this. And then throughout that time as well, then I've obviously um, done further post-grad qualifications. So I now have a master's in psychology and neuroscience of mental health uh, through King's College London, and I graduated with distinction from there. So that was pretty exciting to do that. Yeah. Um, so therefore we now use a lot of neuroscience in terms of how do we help people to achieve more to do their best work, but in a way that feels easier and doesn't take as much what we call cognitive energy. So the big reason people get burnt out is because they're overspending cognitive energy. That's really kind of it (laughs) in a nutshell. Um, But however, why people are overspending cognitive energy and how they're overspending it, well, that's a whole lot to unpack. <laughs> so yeah, so that was kind of the driver of, of why I saw the need for this. And then obviously um, over you know the last 10 years, we've had a lot more neuroscience showing that this is a thing in terms of helping people to achieve more with less cognitive effort. Um, and we've also had a lot of legislation work in our favor. We've had a lot of, I guess, kind of um, highlighting that burnout is now effectively a syndrome as highlighted by the World Health Organization. Um, and obviously we had a pandemic as well, which very much exacerbated our need for all of this. Leaders needed to learn basically new leadership skills or evolve their leadership skills to be able to lead people when they're working from home in a hybrid environment, manage workflow, all of these kind of things. So it's kind of like the last 10 years 
just keeps going more and more in our favour. <laughs> yes. Out of COVID, that was. Exactly. Yeah. We our business just absolutely went gangbusters in COVID. We were really well positioned for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Before we get into to uh, the neuroscience and, sure. and, and unpack that because there's an awful lot to unpack. You mentioned you're in the financial services game and part of the sales team. You're leading up that team. Mm-hmm. And did, 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 was there something there that you sort of went, well, I know we get more of these people. I just can't put my finger on it. Was that a sort of mm-hmm. catalyst for you to reach out? I think that was something that I'd always, there's always a quest for that, right? And I had a high-performing team, so te- the team was amazing. Um, but I was always on the lookout for how do we do it better and also how do we do it easier? And I think it like you never have all the answers to that, right, because more and more research keeps coming out. So I think, um, you know, I think what we were doing was pretty good at the time, but I also think that we, you know, I was always on the lookout for, for different ways of doing it. So I always had the mindset that this this stuff's never done. There's always more to research. There's always more that can be implemented. And so I think when you've got that mindset, then you've just got that continuous improvement mindset. So it must have been a big change for you when you when you did take this leap of faith that you said. You, you're, you're in a business, you're, 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 you're leading the sales team, you've got a high-performance team, so obviously they're doing okay. Mm-hmm. So you obviously paid reasonably well or I'm just teaching some assumption. <laughs> yes. And that leap of faith is a total, all right, we'll just shut that door and we'll move on. You know? Yes. The, so that, that took, well, uh, yeah, I often get asked about that. People say, oh, that was really gutsy. And I was kind of like, well, yes, I guess it was. I think... Um, it, it was definitely for the first 12 months, it was, oh, wow, this whole big paycheck doesn't just appear in my bank account. Oh, okay. I have to actually invoice people. Oh, that's annoying. Okay. But I guess I have to do that. So I think it was that shift of, you know, just going from that you know, big, big income doesn't just kind of land in my account every month, especially while I'm growing the business. Cause the first 12 months, I certainly wasn't earning as much as what I was obviously that, um, that shifted, but that first 12 months, you've really got to get your head around that. Um, but I think the other thing as well is like being in sales, I'm also used to lumpy income mm. as well. So I think that probably helped my cause. I was never just, you know, well, yes, I mean, you know, salary was nice, but um, I've kind of been used to being assessed on performance and getting remunerated that way from a, a bonus and commission structure. So um, I think that probably helped me from from a mindset point of view to go into that. And I think the other thing is like when you're starting off a business is that a lot of people really hate the sales and marketing side of that. Whereas the sales side of things for me, because I'd come from that background, that never worried me. And I always had a great network of people to make a start with. So I didn't have that as a stress. But yes, no, make no mistake. It was like, okay, am I financially? And it probably took me about 12 months just to make sure that like, I felt like I was financially secure because I wanted to go in with this mindset that if I didn't earn anything for 12 months, I was fine. Because I didn't want to have that stress of and that mindset of, oh, I have to earn money and get this person as a client. I just wanted to have that mindset of, I just want to add value. And if stuff comes out of that, then I'm obviously doing something right. So I think having that financial background and that stability as a starting point made a massive difference to me. And the time you've taken this leap of faith and you start in the business, you're also educating yourself and, and getting into psychology, I dare say. Yeah. You, pre, before you got into sales, were you sort of had touched on psychology? Is that- That's a great question. So, um, so my undergrad was a Bachelor of Business with a double major in accounting and finance. So... No, but, psychology there, not. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really interesting. I actually had sleepless nights when I was doing my HSC. Do I do psychology or do I do business? My dad's a chartered accountant, so we know how that turned out. Um, and so I ended up getting business at uh, doing business and I, and I, I loved working. I started in accounting and then I worked into, into financial services. So I used both sides of my major there. I really liked all of that, but having worked in the, like I was also working in the fitness industry alongside of that. 
So we have to do a lot of courses to stay qualified as fitness instructors. And you can do anything from practical stuff to actually there's a lot of um, psychological courses, coaching courses, um, positive psychology kind of came into the fitness um, arena before it came into the corporate space. So I was getting a lot of access to that, not obviously at master's level from King's College London, but um, I was getting a lot of access to that via this other channel, which I think put me in really good stead because I certainly wasn't starting, you know, from scratch when it came to, oh, this is what I want to do. I was actually starting to implement a lot of that with my previous job and going, oh, this, this feels good. This kind of works, you know, let's start to really take a leap of faith. So I felt like I had had it, you know, I didn't sort of just all of a sudden go, now I want to do this and I'll, you know, quit my job tomorrow. It, it was, this was brewing for a bit. Um, so I had to get my ducks in the row financially. And then I had to, um, feel like I was at a stage where it's like, right, I've got enough science behind me for what was available at the time. And with further studies, then I'm in a, I feel like I'm in a good, a good enough position to start this is you're never going to be in the perfect position, but you know, that was kind of you know, the impetus that I had. So yeah, that's great. And, and before we go on, have you found your mojo? Do you think is this you? <laughs> yeah, this is totally me. Much better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I've always loved what I do. I'm a big believer in like, if you don't love what you do, then kind of go and do something else, right? So, um, but I don't know that anyone kind of aspires to be leading a sales team during a global financial crisis. I don't know that that's a career goal when someone's doing their HSC. That's a window <laughs> jumping moment. <laughs> exactly. So I think I've always just loved what I've done and that's led me to other things. And I think that I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if I hadn't done all of that previously. So I, I, I think everything happens at the right time in the right way. Sometimes you just have to trust the process and trust the universe a little bit. Um, but yeah, I do, I do feel like I've definitely found my thing. Right, I do believe you made the universe happen. The universe just didn't come to you. But uh, it's, it's fascinating. Now tell me, um, next evolution performance, how did, how did you sort of come to finding that as your home and be part of that group? Yeah, well, we I, we actually started under another brand. So Alex, my business partner, and I were starting as another brand. Um, and then we decided to rebrand. And the, the reason that we came up with Next Evolution Performance um, was actually from one of our clients. So one of our big corporate clients um, would describe us internally in their company as the next evolution in their leadership coaching programs. And I was like, ooh, really like this next evolution concept. So I'm like on the phone to Alex going, I think we might need a (laughs) rebrand. And uh, it kind of coincided with a few other things that were going on at the time. So it was just, again, it all kind of coincided to be a good time to to rebrand. So hence next evolution performance was born. And uh, yeah, so Alex and I changed the name and off we went. Now you you've mentioned high performance sales teams and and obviously you had connections in the, in the financial services game. So yeah. when you when you open your shingle, you do you go straight into that space and really get into your coaching? Yeah, um, around them. Absolutely. So I was quite specific when I started um, because I thought let's not make this harder than it needs to be. Let's go with people who or an environment that I know and people who also know me and my track record in that area as well. So um, first thing I started with was financial services sales teams. Um, And so I thought, oh, that would be, you know, I'll I'll start there and then see where it goes. Um, And to this day, I still do a lot of work um, in that kind of environment as well. So now I'm probably, uh, for me personally, because obviously different coaches that we have with Next Evolution Performance have different niches um, depending on their background. But for me personally, my background is financial services and accounting. So I do a lot of work with financial services, which obviously encompasses um, dealer groups, financial advisors, insurance companies, um, uh, the banks, uh, fund managers, and all of that space. And then I also do a lot of work with accountants and lawyers, uh, so in professional services. And I've also kind of fallen into engineers and uh, the private school system in Sydney as well. And I think they're the kind of people that really love the science behind what we do. Um, and so we take a lot of the woo-woo out of things. It's like, no, we are very much performance-based and let's make sure that we're helping you do that without burnout. So it's still performance first and foremost, and they love that kind of angle to that and they love the academic 
um, rigor behind what we do as well in all the neuroscience. So they're probably the key sort of spaces that I play in. I have others that have come to us from referrals and things like that, but they're probably sort of the main, the main areas. Out. Yeah. Now we've we've agreed to go ahead with your services um, based on your exceptional sales. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me, uh, how does it work? What do, you, what do you do with a business? How do you how do you go in there and and start your work? Yeah, so uh, so we we deliver in a number of different ways. So we do everything from keynote speaking to workshop facilitation to one to one coaching and team coaching. So they're kind of the ways that we deliver. But I think it's more like firstly we need to work out well what's best for this client. Um, so it depends on the size of the company. We work from very small businesses right up to very large corporates. Um, and when you think about it, a corporate is just a whole bunch of small businesses and teams working under the one umbrella. So, um, so when we do that, we tend to, um, start with what we call a performance call. And that's where we start to ask a whole bunch of questions on where are they at now in terms of the people side of things. So where are people's energies at? Are they, do we have levels of burnout, how people are feeling? Um, are there bottlenecks with workflow? Are there issues with the hybrid environment? Um, do, have they, clearly defined their high performance culture for a hybrid environment? Um, are they really clear on um, the kind of culture indicators that they want to have with their teams? So all of this kind of stuff is, you know, let's work out where things are at at the moment. What's the level of accountability in the teams as well? Do people say they're going to do stuff and then don't get stuff done? Uh, that was always one of my big bugbears working in financial services. It's like, we agreed Friday. Where is it? Um, so, you know, things like that where we kind of use that as a time to uncover where are things at and where would they like them to be. And if there's a, sometimes there's no gap. Sometimes it's just like, yep, things are great. And, and in which case we'll tell them and go, you know what, nothing to see here. You just need to promote that further in your employee value proposition. You're actually doing really great things and you need to promote that further. Um, in a lot of cases we'll go actually to get from there to there, we can help you with that. And then we can give some options as to what that might look like, um, in terms of the mix of, um, some initial upfront kind of work. So that might be sort of initial workshops to get some of the content across and things like that. And then there might be ongoing coaching for people. Sometimes we see that there's more problems with the leaders. Sometimes we go in there and the leaders say, Hey, we've got a problem with this. And we go, okay, so what have you done as leaders? Um, and sometimes it's a leadership issue. So sometimes we might start coaching the leaders first and then we can start to roll out other things. Sometimes we do them simultaneously. It really just depends on the company and what's best to get their results because we are OCD about implementation and getting their results. So if we can get it as quickly as possible, as easy as possible, we kind of work out the best frameworks to do that. And we've done a lot of work. We had to really do a lot of work on that over the pandemic. Um, we really had to get streamlined about um condensing some of the ways that we work and getting far more, um, I guess, kind of obvious in, in terms of some of the, you know, for example, you know, we've now developed just like eight half day workshops that are just off the shelf. That's before we do even more of the tailored work. So we've really had to kind of like try to productize everything, not because we want to be a one size fits all because we're definitely not, but it, that gets us 50% of the way there. That gets us a starting point to go, right, here's where we should probably go from there. Hey, let's get started. And that just means we can get better results for people, but it also means that, um, because we had so much demand for what we were doing over the pandemic, we had to streamline things. We actually got a business coach 18 months ago. They just coach consultants. They're based out of Canada. A lot of their coaches are in the US. So we've got a really global perspective on best practice with that. And they have been instrumental in helping us streamline a lot of the back end stuff so that we can just spend more time with clients because that is what we love to do. With a, with a typical client, would you find that um, I, I director or CEO will reach out to you guys because he, pin, he or she, excuse me, yes. <laughs> has pinpointed an area of the business that's not working. That'll generally be how the door is open to you guys. Yeah. Often there's some sort of, um, there'll be some problem. There's some sort of pain point um, that people are worried about. Um, and generally it's the CEO and, uh, or the C-suite that are those people identifying those kind of problems. Um, so one of the problems we're focusing on at the moment is, um, we're seeing that a lot of people are going through is just 
so much time spent in internal meetings since the pandemic and working in hybrid and we kind of feel like we've got to, you know, over communicate with people now. Um, and there's a lot of spend, time spending in internal meetings, which is causing a lot of burnout for people. There's a lot of people that are spending so much time in these unnecessary meetings that are actually getting time to do the work. And when we look at that in financial services, for every 100 um, employees that a company has, it's costing about $155,000 a day. That's a bit of a scary number. That's a scary number. And that's a big problem to solve, right? So, you know, we are, we're constantly trying to hear about what are these problems. So rather than just go, oh, hey, we do this and do you want some? It's like, tell us your problems. And then, because because those problems are for us to go and research and those problems, um, we can often, and it gets to a point where we end up telling the clients their problems before they even realize what they are sometimes. <laughs> because, yeah, because we just do so much diving into what are the problems um, and then we go off and do some to more some more research on that um, and then we come up with you know different ways to solve that problem so we really focus on this whole idea of you know let's understand what the problems are hopefully we can create some insights for you as to what your problems are before you realize um, but if you feel like there's something not quite right even if you don't know exactly how to articulate those problems chances are it's worth a call. And if there's no problems, we'll tell you. And if there are problems, well, we can work out, you know, what's, what are the ones you really want to solve? What's going to move the dial and what may be a nice to have. And then we can work out, you know, the best ways to get there as quickly as possible to really improve that productivity and cost savings. Yeah. Right. So in particular, you're looking at the, the HR or the people side of the problems, not so much the the processes, if you like, and processes might fall out, but it's really about the people and getting those people humming. Yeah, yeah that's right. So sometimes there might be some systems and processes that they can use to do that. Like, yeah. you know, they might want to set up templates and software and things like that and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, so think of us as like um, business coaching coaches the businesses. Okay. And what are your systems and processes for more efficient in the business? And that's what we had to get a business coach for because it's like, mm, we're not so great at People, no problem. But that side of things, you know, we need we need greater expertise in terms of that. So, um, so business coaches are kind of coaching the business and the strategy and all that kind of stuff. We're going right. Tell us what it is that you want to achieve with the business. What profitability levels? What are your strategic goals? So once that's all been set and understood, we then come in to make sure that the people are well positioned to deliver on that for the for the company um and so sometimes the strategic goals are very simple if you're looking at um you know like uh, smaller businesses and things like that sometimes the, it's a client facing business it's quite simple uh the more complex the company then the more complexity you have in terms of making sure that you've got the right people getting the right messages so that they can work on the right things at the right time with the right mindset and making sure that their the projects are taking less time all of these kind of things so you know the more the more um i guess kind of the bigger the ecosystem that people are working in then the more things that can go wrong in terms of communication and not setting deadlines properly and things not being delivered to that person so that they can do their bit on time and you can have behavioral issues coming in and all this kind of stuff so we look at the humans in the business and how do we get them absolutely firing on all cylinders yeah great so, so to me, it's not like uh, having the right person on the right seat on the on the bus. It's it's more than that. It's yeah. with, with the uh, ingredients and probably a map to to make whatever they're going to make on that bus. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot more to this, and um, you know, we sort of take for granted, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. Tell me a little bit about this cognitive energy. Um, and you mentioned um, in your opening that there's people get low on this cognitive. Cognitive energy, forgive me for not pronouncing it. It's a more than two syllables. Um, so tell me a little bit about that and, and the way it works with your with your education. Mm. So it's a fancy word and uh, or a fancy term, and it's really think of it as like mental energy. And so there's a part of the brain that we call the prefrontal cortex, and that's the part of the brain that is involved in all of our executive function. So it's our learning, it's our decision making, it's basically everything to do with doing our jobs, especially for knowledge workers. Okay. And that part of the brain, ever since we've been able to pop people into MRI machines, we now start to understand more about how that works. 
Um, another big thing that we've been able to understand since um, a lot of this research came, you know, started being done on, on people's brains is that we can see how much energy is getting spent. So a lot of people think about energy as a physical thing, um, like, oh, well, do I feel like I have enough energy to go for a walk or exercise and things like that? But what they don't realize is that our brain is metabolically hungry. It takes in about 25% of the fuel that we take into our bodies. Oh my I know, right? That's a lot. It's a lot. It's a hog. <laughs> the, brain, the brain is a hog. Absolutely. And so, you know, I think sometimes our arms and legs are the least of our worries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so because the brain is metabolically hungry, think of that as like we spend so much energy on things that often we don't need to. And therefore, because it's so hungry, we need to make sure that we're using our energy really effectively. So similar, th think of it like in a physical environment. Like if you look at an athlete, especially professional athletes, they are really focused on how do they execute, whether it's running, swimming, etc. how do they execute using the least amount of physical energy possible for the quickest results? So we're kind of helping people to do that, but with the brain. So how do we help you to achieve whatever strategic goals that you have that are important to you? How do we help you to achieve that with the least amount of cognitive energy being spent possible. Because when you think about it, it, we've all had those days where we get to the end of the day and it's like, oh my gosh, I've barely left my desk. I've done about 300 steps, but I feel like I've run a marathon. And it's that same feeling of depletion, but it's come from cognitive energy. And you can actually end up feeling hungry that way as well. I remember when I was doing my master's, um, there would be times if I, if I was having, you know, a fair, fairly intense kind of study periods around that, like I'm really hungry <laughs> and, and, and it's not because I've, you know, exercised any more than, than what I would normally be doing. And so, you know, your brain just, it churns through this stuff, right? And so the more that we can help people to, to use less of that, the better. And there's so many ways that we can do that. You know, overthinking takes cognitive energy. Um, if you're dealing with someone at work who's stressed and that conversation just got harder or that person didn't deliver what they were supposed to deliver by the time they said they were going to deliver it by, and you've got to have a conversation like that. If you don't have frameworks set up for that, that conversation can take a lot of cognitive energy. If you have better frameworks in place, then that's not a hard conversation anymore because you've got the right frameworks to do that and it takes a whole lot less effort. But even just little things like um, just knowing that we have about four hours a day of heavy cognitive energy available to us. Available? Yeah. Okay. That's it, right? Okay. So do the maths. That's less than we're working. But if I'm right? four and a half hours, I'll just go and eat some. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, it's like we can replenish it by taking breaks and doing other things throughout the day. Yeah. Um, but the, the most important thing is it's like if you understand that, if like we, we help a lot of people, even just as our very base starting point, is that if they understand their four hours of cognitive energy, then we can't – we can't try to do more than four hours of heavy work. So we can do other stuff that's not feeling so heavy. So I'm not worried about the number of hours that people work. That is that is not the reason people are getting burnt out. Okay. Yeah. I'm the last person to say that I love working. Yeah. But I don't have more than four hours a day of heavy work to do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I can sustain, you know, way longer working hours than what some people can do. And the trick is, if, is if you can really optimize your four hours of cognitive power in a day, you can get done in four hours what most people are taking six hours to do. Wow. I know, right? right? So imagine if everyone in a business or just you personally had an extra two hours of effective time in your day. What would that mean? Use that how you will. That's not my problem. <laughs> so you're talking about a 50% increase in performance. Yeah. Well, I mean, if people are working over, think about it as maybe say a, a 20, 25%, depending on the number of days, Sorry, okay. hours that they're working in a day. Yeah. All right. So we're not saying everyone should pull up stumps by midday, yeah. but what we are saying is that we have to really be very strategic around 
the type of cognitive work that we're doing and making sure it's no more than that four hours in a day or it's just not neuroscientifically possible. And then, of course, you end up beating yourself up for not being able, being able to do what was never neuroscientifically possible to do in the first place. <laughs> and that takes more energy. <laughs> yeah. So there is actually an impossible when it comes to work. Yeah. Uh, tell me, uh, the, the cognitive, the, the heavy cognitive lifting for yep. the four hours. Yeah. What does that mean? Is that like really putting your head down and crunching the numbers? or How does it work? Yeah. Define the light versus the heavy. Make you know, it easy. It depends on the person, right? Yeah, right. Okay. So, and this is why, you know, we can't put a slide up and say everyone should structure their day this way. <laughs> <laughs> because, but what we can do is we can provide frameworks to say, look, you've probably only got four hours of heavy cognitive work. So the first step is just to understand, well, what is heavy cognitive work? for you yeah and it's different for everyone right so like i did a um i did a uh, a webinar recently to barristers and the barristers were saying oh but everything that we do is heavy and it's like everything that you do seems heavy to me but it's not heavy to you you're trained for this and you love it okay so everyone's different right and and even like um you know, when I'm, if I'm doing some, some, uh, reading of a lot of the neuroscience academic papers out there, I've got some parts of that that I find quite heavy and I've got other parts of that that I find quite light. And so it's how I do that that matters. It's when I do that that matters. Um, and so putting all of this into practice can really help people to do things differently. Um, we also find that some people, if you can systematize something, sometimes that turn something from heavy to medium or lighter. So, you know, it's, it's the, the idea is, is to get people to consistently ask the question, if something feels like it's a heavy use of energy, like it's like, oh, I did that and I'm kind of like, you know, it, it, it's like I, I only spent 15 minutes doing that, but, gee, I feel quite spent, okay? You do that three times a day and you could be all out of juice by 10 a.m. Yeah. So it's when we when we have that experience and when we recognise it, how do we then ask, ask ourselves, how do we do that easier? Mm-hmm. Or be conscious that it is heavy and yeah. it might work for me at this time in the day. Yeah, that's right. So different people have got their hours of power at different times. Okay. So if some people are not morning people, <laughs> just, you know, asking for a friend, um, <laughs> then you know, I, so many people say, oh, you get up and you do the worst thing first. And I used to be like, that's just going to make me want to sleep in for longer. Like that's not inspiring to get up. Whereas what we should do if you're not a morning person is actually just get up and do light stuff. Mm. And that feels far less threatening to get up and do. And before you know it, you've started to get into the swing of things and now it's time to do heavier stuff. And it works really well. So this whole one size fits all of everyone should be morning people and everyone should get up early and everyone should do the worst thing first and all this kind of stuff. No, if you're a morning person, fine. But that's only about 60% of the population, Mm, mm. if that. Now that we're getting more categories coming through, there's more research coming through in terms of, you know, who's kind of what chronotypes. But, yeah, broadly speaking. So if we identify everyone's cognitive energy points and their peak times in the day, it sounds like you'll have a riffraff of people doing multitude of things at different times. How the hell do we manage that? That's a great question. Then, then it comes down to your negotiation skills, Simon. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> the sales head on again. That's right. So, yeah, but he said it has massive implications for teams, right? So um, as an example, like when I worked in financial services, we had a team meeting at 10.30 a.m. because the non-morning people had kind of come to terms with being alive by that stage. We hadn't lost the morning people by that stage and we could have a really energising discussion and come up with some creative thinking and strategic thinking about, you know, how do we do this better and blah, blah, blah. But if we had have done that, you know, at certain times which didn't suit half the team, that wouldn't have been as productive. So that's just a really small example. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, so helping people to structure their days, their weeks, their months and years, that's really one of the foundations of what we do around cognitive energy. Then we can start getting into more of the complex stuff around that, like, you know, how does Zoom fatigue impact the brain? And, you know, why, how, how can some people work for eight hours on Zoom and not be fatigued? Um, and other people are one hour on Zoom and they're, you know, having 
having a, a, a stressful moment. Mm. So, uh, so we we do a lot of neuroscience around that with helping people understand the what's going on in our brains when we're in a hybrid environment. Um, ambiguity, for example, the brain hates it. So, if we have a lack of role clarity, if we have a lack of what we call key culture indicators of how we do things around here, if we have a lack of accountability so that people are not getting things done on time and it's causing concern to other people, all of these kind of things, if we can get rid of all of those things by just creating more clarity, it saves so much cognitive energy. So people who have better leadership skills are going to be saving their teams a whole lot of cognitive energy. So the role of a leader should be how do we get um, how do we really get clear on, on what we're aiming to achieve and then how do we work together to get really clear on what needs to be done, by who, by when, how, how do we do it lazier, all of these kind of things so that we can really help people to kick their goals. It sounds like the, um, the people and understanding themselves is pretty key in this. Like how can you work out what's going to be your sure bliss and time and effort, and, and and so do you do a lot on that on the person themselves? Yeah, it's so true. So um, you're right. In a lot of cases, people are worried about other people, and it's like, well, have you really thought about how you're best to operate? So um, so we definitely get people to look inside and do this stuff on themselves first. And even in a workshop environment, we say, right, be selfish, focus on you first. Then we can go into a leadership space. So it's like, right, now that you've done the work there, and now that you're understanding how you are best to operate. How do we then take that back to our teams? Mm. How do we then lead others so that they are operating in the way that works best for them? Mm. No, that's, that's very interesting. Mm. And, and in terms of um, these measurements, I mean, you mentioned before 100 employees cost you $155,000 a day. You potentially can save 20, 25% by teaching these people. Mm. That's a fairly big number yeah. in, in, a, in a very short period of time. That's right. Yeah. So if we can, um, cause we're all about return on investment, right? You know, so we want to make sure that people understand that yes, if we're spending this, we are going to get this as a return on that investment. And we never want to take on business where we don't believe that we can get the return on investment that they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we do need to work with people who understand return on investment and a big part of one of the first things we'll get people to do is actually look at their average hourly rate of salary. Okay, and obviously if there's bonuses, you know, factor that in in some way, shape or form. But we help people to work out what that would be um, and then to calculate that and then look at that across two people, two hours per person per day and what does that add up to on an annual basis. And that's even just one of the um, of the aspects of return on investment that we focus on from a savings point of view. It's pretty incredible, that number. That's massive. It wouldn't be hard to justify. No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, and and in, in terms of the outcomes, you mentioned the savings. Do you find that there's a there's a an easy way to identify that and really quick figure on that saving? You, you... Yeah. So the savings are, are quite easy. So you you've got a couple of things to think about. You've got if you have employee turnover, so, and again, most people have some form of turnover um, records, um, and so we look at that and say, well. At two and a half times a person's salary to replace that person, that is actually the hidden cost of what you've effectively had to spend without spending kind of thing um, in terms of that's the hit to your bottom line because you've had people had to you know train somebody up. Not only that, the people that are left there, they end up having more stress because they're kind of like trying to fill the gaps before the next person comes on board. The next person who comes on board will never do as good a job for – depending on the role, anywhere between 12 to 18 to 24 months as the previous person did. So you've got a loss of productivity with that. Um, so, yeah, so you've got you've got turnover issues of two and a half times a person's salary. You've got those per hour rates. You've got if people are spending a lot of time in internal meetings, that's that figure there of $155,000 per 100 people per day, um, just based on the fact that people are spending more than four hours in internal meetings. And that's just based on, um, I think we base that on five hours. And a lot of people are spending a lot more time in internal meetings than that. So, um, so you've got that in terms of the opportunity cost there. Um, but then you've also got, um, you've got sick leave, 
you've got mental health leave. Mm. So if people end up with having mental health problems, um, generally speaking from some of our insurance company clients, the average time that someone will spend on a mental health claim is 17 months. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. So you've got 17 months of someone that's not as productive and you've got 17 months of someone else who has to um, pick up the slack for that and that that's not without ramifications um so that's an expensive exercise for people not to mention you know the the impacts of managing that um obviously you've got sick leave so however long people need to take for sick leave because even just the average cold and flu that is all caused because people are out of cognitive energy and because they're not managing their stress levels properly if you have if you don't have a good relationship with stress and you don't know how to make stress work for you and you're getting overwhelmed by that, then stress is one of the, the hormone, the stress hormone cortisol is, um, is a suppressant of the effectiveness of the immune system. So if you have people in your business who are constantly colds, flu, they get everything that's going around. And of course, there's always that excuse of, oh, I've got kids and I've got planes and, you know, I, I travel and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like excuse, excuse, excuse. If your immune system is where it should be because you're managing your energy well, those excuses are just excuses. Yeah. That's really interesting. And and, and, in, and in terms of the, the people, I dare say if you're pinpointing all these and structuring their lives, or their work, mm. you know, they're going to actually enjoy it more themselves. So they- 100%. We've been talking a lot about employee value proposition yeah. with our clients because obviously, you know, the whole world is short-staffed right now, okay? Mm. And, I mean, you know, a lot of people say there's a war for talent and I'm like, there's always a war for talent and, quite frankly, it's over and the talent won years ago. <laughs> so um, regardless of whatever economic cycle that we're in, company and companies probably um, – you know, there's a, there's a bit of a focus on employee value proposition, arguably not as much as it should be, but small businesses don't put anywhere near the value um, or the, the effort into their employee value proposition as they should. So we want to have a great employee value proposition which jumps off the website so that people can attract and hire the right staff because that costs less money as well, right? If you've got the right staff coming to you because you're known for having a great employee value proposition, that costs you a fortune. So let's get that right. But I think a lot of the people that get caught up in this employee value proposition needs to be around the perks that they're offering and the yoga classes and we've got a fruit bowl and blah, 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 blah. That's not it, all right? At the end of the day, people want to be able to do their best work in a way where they don't have to be tired doing it. People are just tired of being tired. And people just want a great job where in whatever level that is to them, which allows them to do it in a way that feels easy. Mm. And if we can if we can do more of that and we can create an environment, so if if a larger or small company is able to work in a way where they're coaching their teams to understand cognitive energy, to understand accountability, psychological safety, leadership outcomes, meeting effectiveness, get people out of internal meetings, you know, any one of our topics of that we have of our even our off-the-shelf workshops, if people can understand all of that, that goes a long way to, to you being able to say, we coach you to do your best work without feeling tired. I mean, for all those employers out there, they've got to be amazing if people were approaching them and asking for a job. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, if, if you are known for being more of a burnout culture or yeah. not focusing on this kind of stuff, yeah. you know, high performers who want to work in that, that kind of environment where they can just get the results and get out. Mm. You know, I've always been like that myself. I'm just like, right, what is it that I need to do so that at the end of 12 months you'll say, it's a good thing she's here. Yeah. Okay. Done it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me what that is, and I've got twelve months, and admittedly, it's easy being in sales because it's a very unambiguous KPI. You've got one number, twelve months, sort that out. Yeah. Um, but I always just think, well, yeah, and how do I do it easier? Mm. And how do I do it lazier? And how do I do it with the least amount of effort required, mm. so that I'm assessed on my outcomes? And so, lead- outcomes-based leadership is a lot harder than people think because most people don't set up the frameworks of psychological safety and accountability and therefore, you know, it all goes awry. So if we can get this kind of stuff way easier so that people come to work and not get burnt out, like it seems really simple, but that is what people want. 
these days. Mm. It's interesting because if you, if you you take your your word lazy, and it's not quite the right word, it's mm. the context, but you feel if you're being lazy, you're not achieving, and therefore you're going to get a have a problem internally because you're you're working lazily. In fact, you're not. You're working smart, less harder, and it could feel lazy. So we've got to get that mindset right. Too. It's so true, and I'm glad that you raised that. And the thing is, the reason that we end up assessing people as good employees if they work hard yeah. is because leadership has not been good enough to really articulate the outcomes that are required. So if the outcomes that are required are really clearly articulated and people get them, that's what we should be rewarding people for. Like I'm seeing people now who, you know, and I wrote a blog about this, it's going to be published in the not too distant future, but it's like people are literally putting on their performance appraisals I'm working really, really hard and I'm really tired and therefore I deserve a pay rise. Mm. I'm like, are you kidding me? Mm. That's that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing that they're encouraged to do that and it's not a good thing that they think that they should be rewarded for that. Um, they should be rewarded for getting outcomes. Yeah, so gone are the days of so uh, I'm in there at 7 and I'm leaving at 7 at night. That's not the right way to look at it, right? No. No, yeah. that's right. If you can do that effortlessly and that gets you great outcomes and more outcomes than the next person, do that. But if you're working from seven to seven just to look busy and you're not getting the outcomes, oh, my gosh, new plan required. Yeah. Quite easy in sales. Here's your hurdle. Here's yeah. the number you've got to reach in 12 months and go get it. So that's your outcome. Mm. Um, so more yeah. importantly then for those employers as well, the, the, the Articulating and finding the KPIs around employees that yes. can make them work to that level at their own pace and in a way that they know what they've got to achieve is, is sort of utopia, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So you've got to be really clear. So KPIs are your key performance indicators. So yeah. think about that as um, what needs to be done. Like what do you need someone to do to or to achieve at the end of the year to go, yeah, useful, let's keep them. <laughs> Um, but then we have what we call key culture indicators because often what we find is like when people aren't performing as well as they could be, um, they're often performing at a level which is just enough, but it's their attitude that's not right. It's their mindset that's not right. It's they're a bit negative about the whole thing. They're, you know, complaining about stuff around the water cooler or whatever and it's that kind of stuff which is a cancer on a business. Well, they say they're going to do something and they don't and they don't even, like, apologise and alone get it done. So it's all that kind of stuff where it makes it hard for your high performers. And high performers don't want to work with that. And if you look at research on high-performing teams, high performers want to work with people who share their values. Now, if you do a values assessment on anyone who's a high performer, one of their top five values or at least one of their top five values will be something around performance, achievement, goal setting, all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so if you tolerate underperforming staff or average performing staff, you'll end up losing the high performers and you'll end up with the mediocre staff that's left. Wow. That's yeah. dangerous in, in a big way, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, the high performance staff are hard to get. Yep. Yeah. And are you trying to say in, in a bit of a cloak and dagger way if you've got low performance staff they need to be addressed very quickly but more so they just might not be on the right side on the butts or is it more so that they just haven't been educated in your way yeah great points and both so what we generally find is when we go into a business um quite often we will even even the people um like the leaders in the teams that we work with will probably highlight oh, i'm worried about this person i'm worried about this person this person's not you know da 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 and even when I've done workshops, like the initial workshops that I do with teams, even I will be like, oh, gosh, even I'm worried about so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. -so. Um, but what we find, though, is that, and I'm often pleasantly surprised, so I never make my judgment anymore off the bat because I have been wrong, <laughs> so I'm often pleasantly surprised. The reason people underperform, two reasons. Yep, you're right. They might not be the right person for that job, in yeah. which case, totally fine. Yeah. Okay, no problems, we'll set them free and get them to do something like life is too short, literally. Yeah, that could never change the spot. Exactly. But then in in the majority of cases, and to be fair, even more than what we think um, initially, in the majority of cases, people are underperforming because 
they've got ambiguity. Mm. They haven't been told a framework of once we agree to do something, we do it. Mm. Or we communicate early if we've hit a problem. Mm. So it's like if you haven't talked about that, that stuff doesn't happen by osmosis. Yeah. So once the frameworks are there and once that kind of bar is set, people go, oh, well, that's what I need to do. And that clarity generally lifts people up. So often we find that people say, oh, look, you know, if they're just not performing, then just get them off the bus really quickly. And I'm like, interestingly enough, I would say probably in about 80% of cases that people would be normally very quick to discount and go, that person needs to get off the bus. They didn't need that. They needed clarity. Mm -hmm. And once they got clarity, you end up retaining that person and getting the best out of them. Now, that is a whole lot cheaper than having to get that person off the bus, find a new person for the bus, keep the bus going while that person's not on the bus, Mm. et cetera. There's your two and a half. There you go. Right. Mm -hmm. It's been amazing. Um, In terms of you and and your business and and for those people out there, how how do we find you and how do we sort of work on what is going to be right for our business? Because it sounds like there's so many moving bits to this. (laughs) Doing my editing with all the things, I'm trying to think of the stuff I do well at work and a lot of it I don't do well. But in terms of that, how do they identify and find you and, and what's the best way to get into this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I love what our business coaches say. They say take imperfect action. So um, so I think start with some of the basics. It certainly helps. So um, in terms of how people find us, our website is a good place to start. So nextevolutionperformance.com. Super easy to find from there and then make contact with us from there. Um, we are also very easy to stalk on LinkedIn as individuals as well. So Vanessa Bennett on LinkedIn from Next Evolution Performance. I pump out a bucket load of content um, there. So if people are running businesses and they're on LinkedIn, then, you know, definitely get on there. That's probably my main platform. Um, But we also, as a starting point, like if people just want to get some of this real basic kind of understanding of cognitive energy, we've, we've got some really low cost options for people to come and experience some of what we do. And um, one of them is a self paced online course. Um, And that's at nextevolutionenergy.com or you can find it through our Next Evolution Performance as well. So that is, um, it's eight modules delivered over six weeks. You've got 12 weeks to get through it, Um, but it's a great way to just get, you know, 10 to 15 minutes worth of videos explaining a particular topic of this and then spending the rest of that week to start to put that into practice and think about how you're going to use those frameworks for you personally. So we get a lot of people who come into Next Evolution Energy and and our signature course on that is the neuroscience of getting more done, which, you know, sounds useful. Um, And so that's a great place for people to start. So that's really good. Um, We also do open workshops online. So under the events section of our Next Evolution Performance website, um, we've got uh, open workshops that we run uh, twice a year. So the next ones, um, they're generally around May and October. Um, And that's a really great way to experience that in a live environment with other people from other businesses, just as a starting point. So we just do that as a per person rate. Um, And we also just run our, our monthly, what we call 2020 series. That's also on our events page totally free, 11 o'clock on the first Wednesday of every month. Just grab a cuppa or a vino, depending on your time zone. We get a few North Americans checking in as well Um, and from around the globe. Um, Register for the recording if you can't make the time, but we do 20 minutes of us coaches riffing about a particular topic and 20 minutes where we answer Q&A live. So if you want to pick our brains free of charge, that's a really good one to to turn up to. So that's, that's anyone can join that one. Um, so yeah, some really great low cost and zero cost options to, to find us. And then if people are interested in more of our, you know, workshops and teams and one-to-one coaching and things like that, again, via our website, then you can book a performance call with us and we'll discuss where you're at, where you want to be. And then we can make some either recommendations on the spot, um, or we can start to work out, you know, what, what are some ways that we might be able to help you to get there. Yeah. So the the next um, evolution energy. Yes. That one. It sounds quite interesting. Would you say that that's more targeted at the employer to be aware, and then they can look at how they could bring you guys into their business too? 
help with it? Both, yeah. yeah. Some employees at work. So, yeah, uh, I say for a lot of people, you know, when they when they come to us, because like, even our open online workshops where they're in with other people, um, a lot of people um, come to that on the basis of, oh, I'm looking at this to experience it so that we can work out, do we want to do it in our business? Yeah. But I always say to people, be selfish. Do this for yourself first, see that it works, feel it, and then you're in better position to go, yeah, I can see how this would be super useful um, to roll it out further. Fascinating. Hmm. Look, a, a couple of takeouts for me. Um, the the key one that you said, and, and it's something that we don't think of, even even the best teams or businesses need a coach. Yeah. And, and you look at every sporting team out there, everyone's got a coach and a psychologist and and probably a number of other people following in the, in the stream, but generally a coach to bring out the, your best. And, and even you guys have a coach to get the best out oh, of you. Absolutely. We've got a business coach. Um, me personally, even though I'm a fitness instructor, I have a personal trainer. You know, I love outsourcing stuff. I have financial advisors, even though I have, you know, worked in financial services for many years. I just think, you know, I, I, the, the best way for me to use my cognitive energy effectively is to outsource the stuff and bring in experts so that I don't have to focus on stuff that's not my main day-to-day. Must be a bit of accountability around that too, right? Yes, <laughs> true, yes. <laughs> and and the, the employee value proposition, you know, it, it, it's a pretty key one. Um, you mentioned yeah. that, you know, that there's a war for talent. And it's a bit like COVID took a few million people and just wiped them out. Mm. It was every country and every place yeah. I heard people couldn't find people to work and it was just where they were gone. Mm. So that that's a classic and, and really be the place that people want to go to work. Yeah. People reaching out to you, you know, you've got a good tick in that spot, right? And then not just KPIs but key culture indicators. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty big one that well, we don't look at very well. Uh, I know we as a business try and implement KPIs for our team, but you may not look at that other side. Yeah, the, the key culture indicators will save you a bucket load of leadership time, especially for people where leadership's not their full-time job. You want to make that as streamlined as possible. And the reason that leadership becomes so hard for so many people is because they don't set up the frameworks as a base. So incorporating the right culture that you want in people's um, performance appraisals means that you are more likely to get those what we call behaviours, activities and mindset indicators that you want to see from people. And it just saves everyone a whole lot of angst, a whole lot of cognitive energy. So if if that's set up, that's um, really useful for the business. I also say to people, if you if you feel like your culture is amazing and everything's great and nothing to see here, I always tell people, document it because that's a your selling point it's a big part of your employee value proposition but b it takes one person to come in who didn't get the unwritten memo because it was unwritten gotcha okay they're very important yeah it's fall apart exactly so you know if you if your culture is absolutely where you want it to be write down every aspect of what makes it amazing okay nice one and, and in the um, in the effort to keep your cognitive energy um, high, Vanessa, I'm going to sort of wrap up on this. <laughs> and, and I want to say thank you so much. I mean, it's, for me, it's been a great little learning experience just in this chat, and I hope everyone out there can take some of that in. And there is an awful lot to it. Like, it's very clear that, you know, that you think you've got, uh, you know, one little part of your business right, and then there's a leak over the other side you haven't looked at, and a lot is around these people. And, and very clearly, the, the, the war for people or, or talent is, is going to drive your business. So it's very important. So, Vanessa, I think, look, thank you. Um, once again, Vanessa Bennett, uh, Next Evolution Performance. And, um, Vanessa, we look forward to um, hearing how your journey goes in the, in the coming bits. Thank you so much, Simon. Great to speak with you today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to NAB Talk. If you'd like to catch up on other episodes from this series or previous, head to our NAB Wealth website. Until next time.